Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Movie Mayhem, and joining me today, my co-host, Chase Morgan Hewlett. Chase, how are you doing? Good, how are you, Donnie? Not too bad. We're coming off a hiatus here. I know it's been like two weeks, but Chase, there's this thing out there called the Oscars that has taken place two weekends ago, and, you know, it's something that I guess is important in the film industry and the film people like ourselves, like the geeks of the world, so I think we're going to dive into that. But before we address the elephant in the room, because I know there's, we could jump right to one film and talk about it, because that basically was the night of that one film. We're going to jump to maybe like a Best Supporting Actress here. We have Davine Joy Randolph, which is in the movie, what movie was that, Chase? You have that pulled up, right? Yeah, it's a movie called The Holdovers. Um, I have not seen this film, but the director of The Holdovers directed a movie called Sideways that I have seen before. It was all right. It It's kind of the indie comedy type style kind of like little miss sunshine if you've ever seen that film um that's the kind of style it is it seems like uh it looked pretty funny um but the holdovers it wasn't a film i was like really anxious to see but i'm sure if you watched it you would enjoy it but no i have not seen it but it's called the holdovers uh she won it and it sounds like it was really awesome for her to win because she seems pretty emotional and pretty it was exciting i know there was a few articles just about her in general. So, good job. And also, I believe she was not the clear front runner for this award, too. I don't have the nominees pulled up in front of us, but it's always cool when you have that story about somebody that, like, isn't expected to win. Although, being on the other end of it, if you are expected to win and you lose, I guess that's a different scenario where I guess that's a little bit harder. When you have your accepted speech, which I, when you have an awards, everybody, I feel like you shouldn't prep an accept ex- an acceptance speech. I feel like that could go really, really sour really good. Really, really, really quickly. Yeah. Do what Joe Pesci did for Goodfellas. He said, thank you, and moved out. <laughs> That's all he said. <laughs> there was one moment, I think it was during Best Director, because Scorsese was up for um, Killers of the Flower Moon, I believe. So he was up for Best yep. Director for that film. And, you know, they did something cool this year at the Oscars where they had, like, for the four or five different people that were nominated they had somebody come out and talk specifically about them like it was a former person that had won that award before and I, I can't i can't remember who was specifically speaking about martin scorsese but he's he almost pulled a moonlight la la land type scenario because he was talking about him and he said and he said that i hope i congratulate you on winning this award like that he like had won the award and then he stopped and he just he like stopped. nominee <laughs> And he's like, yeah. he gave a bow. He's like, my bad. And the audience kind of like reacted like, oh, so, I mean, granted, we're going to talk about Nolan winning that award here coming up. However, that could have been a major conflict if Scorsese did get it because then you question if things are leaked or rigged or people know. So glad we didn't have that happen. We did not have that happen. And since we're on the supporting role for the actress side we might as well mention the supporting role for the male side which is robert downey jr i'm so happy he won the award uh his acceptance speech was funny and i saw comments that said you know robert downey jr won the award but tony stark accepted the award and i that's so funny to me so i'm really glad he won he deserved it um excited to see what he's gonna do in the future but good job downing that was that was pretty cool to see I like to blame my rough childhood and the academy in that order. That is exactly (laughs) his line. And um, for people that know about Downey, um, everybody knows, of course, the blunder that Jimmy Kimmel opened the show with during his opening monologue, which, you know, it ruffled a few feathers, to say the least, in the media. However, great for Downey because this was one of the situations where he was, you know, we just talked about, like, we weren't sure who the favorites were. He was the favorite for this award going into it. His role as Strauss and Oppenheimer proved why he should have been nominated and did win um he wasn't the one i was concerned about i was like 99 percent sure that he was getting this award um yeah. with, without a doubt he again there are certain films that i didn't watch so to say it's like the quote-unquote best you know it's hard because when you don't watch all the film uh award, you know all the films that are in the award shows it's hard to say what is the best but as somebody that has been campaigning for Oppenheimer all year long in 2023, which was one of my most hyped films, because again, being a history buff, being a Chris Nolan fan, this was my most hyped and it lived up to it, the whole three hour long epic. And I'm yeah. so glad for Downey. And there's times where Downey actually, I said he outsh- outshined Killian Murphy, which 
you know, maybe we should jump right into it, Chase, because Killian Murphy, he was the one in which I was afraid was not going to get the award. He was oh, okay. he, he was the one on the list of Oppenheimer where I was kind of scared for him because he did deserve it in my opinion. But yeah, you know, if hit when he got the award, because again it goes the list of is like sound, score, set design, then you get the supporting actors and it leads up to the main actors, then it leads up to directors and then eventually best picture. That's kind of how the award show goes. It kind of grows from like the you don't want to say the smaller awards, you know, but like the, the awards down at the bottom tier all the way up. So once, of course, sound went to Oppenheimer, you had um, editing with Oppenheimer, and then you had Robert Downey Jr. win for Best Supporting. Sound did not go to Oppenheimer. Score, sound excuse me, score, score. I'm at score, yes. my bad. Don't, don't murder me, internet. Anyways, um, so score, editing, and then you had Robert Downey Jr. come in with his Best Supporting Actor. And it was at the moment where it was like, okay, Killian's up for this award. And can he win it? And that was the one that terrified me the most. And when he did, it gave me more of a... It gave me more sure that um, Nolan was going to win. You know, it kind of all built up because it's like, how could they give the, the two best actors the award and Supporting Actor and then not give the director the award? Yeah. You know, the only one I was worried about Oppenheimer wise was sound, and it didn't win for sound. But the zone of interest won for sound. And I haven't seen that film. I was hoping that the creator, that film, which it was nominated for, I was hoping that that one would win because I saw that in theaters as well as Oppenheimer, and I love the sound in the creator. It's such a cool film. It's on Hulu, so go watch it if you can. Um, but I was hoping it would win, but that was the only award that I thought that Oppenheimer might not win, which is kind of funny because when I first heard of Oppenheimer, the thing that they were really showcasing and really bragging about and was really hyped up was the sound. That that That's what was really hyped up for me. That and the black and white IMAX scenes, which were beautifully done, which is what you see Robert Downey Jr. in. But... Um, so yeah, I didn't win for sound, but Zone of Interest did. Um, there were a couple, <clears throat> excuse me, there were a couple exciting moments about the Oscars that I thought was really good. One of them is being the um, visual effects, the film that won the visual effects, which Godzilla minus one. It won that one, and that is such a cool thing to see that a Godzilla movie won an Academy Award. For all the Godzilla fans out there, like I'm a, I love Godzilla. So watching like Matthew Broderick's Godzilla and watching even the 2016 one, which isn't my favorite, but I'll deal with it. Um, I saw this Instagram post of all the different Godzilla creations over the years, from the 50s all the way to the new, and they're holding up this the new Godzilla and congratulating him i thought that was a cool post but i'm so glad that it won it because i saw that movie twice in theaters and i didn't get bored once i didn't get tired of the film so it was really cool that that movie won for visual effects and that really was an underdog story because i don't i can't tell you that too many people going into the year 2023 thought that godzilla minus one would actually be like a fan favorite or a cult classic um, I, I don't think that was really on anybody's agenda or like anybody's list leading into the year. So it was a nice little surprise and glad that it did win. Like I said, to to have a Godzilla film, because I can't tell you off the top of my head, which I mean, we can look online and see when's the last time a Godzilla film won an award. That's like an Amer you know, an American award. But that was it was crazy to hear that, that was announced. Like to me it was just like, you know, a phenomenal moment for not only the culture but like the classics and like to bring it all in one i thought that was really cool as well i i was really happy and have you seen godzilla minus one no you keep telling me to go see it or you keep you emphasized to go see it in theaters and then now that it's on streaming or that i can get it on pay on demand yes uh, i have not though but you should <laughs> yes it, although i i do have to say the uh your hit or miss race, hit or miss rate, by the way, Chase. Okay, I actually enjoyed. Now we're taking a slightly detour away from the Oscars, just so I could bring this point in. Chase is almost really good with his recommendations for me. 
I actually enjoyed ISS. I haven't seen the boys. Okay. I haven't seen the boys in the boat, but I want to see it. And I think it's actually going to be a good hit. However, Chase, I did fall asleep the other day watching Wonka. Oh, you watched it finally? I did, and I fell asleep. So, <laughs> okay, okay. It yeah. wasn't for me. I mean, so it, it it was a miss on your part, at least recommendation for me. Well, I I I like the Gene Wilder one. So, um, the Timothy Chalamet, he he did good as Wonka. Like he did a good job, but I like the other one better. So, yeah. and I, I get it. But I watched it in theaters, and when you watch a movie in theaters, I think it's better. Yeah, it's like, a, it's it a different better. reaction. Yeah. It is so because I've seen movies in theaters and then watched them like on my TV and I'm like it wasn't as good. But um, now I'm no, sure you, um, I'm, I'm sure you have some things to say about this film because best makeup went to Poor Things. Best makeup. Yep. So I watched Poor Things today, and it's a very interesting film. It also won the, um, I think it won costume. In fact, it did. It did win costume. So I won costume. Every award that it won deserved the win. It deserved it. It was a really well put together film. It's a very interesting film. So the director of that film is a director of a couple films like The Lobster, The Favorite, like those type of films. It was an odd movie. Do I say, would I watch it again? No, I don't need to. It's pretty much a sexualized Frankenstein. Imagine if Frankenstein's monster figured out that he can have sex and that sex was fun that is what poor things is that's exactly what it is uh there's some funny moments in it um but overall i don't think it deserved to be nominated for best picture in my opinion i think i'm glad that it went to oppenheimer but um emma stone absolutely killed that role she did so well being from the beginning of the film the someone that can't even talk and speaks in like the third person to being this like smart, intelligent being at the end of the film. Swore it. Um, but it had a pretty cool, um, it was pretty well, it was well done, but it's an odd movie. I, I, I would advise you, Donnie, just to give it a try. Watch half of it. I don't know. Watch a few scenes just to see what it's like, but it's an odd movie, but it deserved every award. Um, the only, for uh, the Academy Award for Leading Actress, I was really hoping that Lily Gladstone from Killers of the Flower Moon, I was really hoping she'd win. Because A, I watched Killers of the Flower Moon, and it was an okay Scorsese film, but her character and her role in that movie was amazing. She did so well. And two, she's from montana and she's actually from a town that's like maybe 20 minutes from me and she was she's a local montana um actor actress and it was cool to see her lead all the way up to a scorsese film and that actually the university of montana where i went to college is actually giving her an award on may 11th oh that's cool uh, some kind of an award because she went to school there and i'm gonna going i'm gonna go and attend that and hopefully meet her and whatnot but um, I was really hoping she won. She won the Golden Globe for her performance, but she did not win this. But at least she was nominated. So, but no, um, Emma Stone did amazing in Poor Things. And Poor Things overall, if you look at it from the film perspective, was a good movie. They did a good job. But as a storyline and my taste in movies, it's an odd one. It's very odd. So that that's my rating for Poor Things. And this is a film that had Mark Ruffalo too, right? That's where he was nominated. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And he, uh, it's funny because he played the part well. And then there were times I'm like, it doesn't feel like his film. Like, it doesn't feel like a film he would do. But then there were times where he did really good. And I'm like, this is so Mark Ruffalo. So it was an odd casting. In fact, I was reading about it and Ruffalo himself was like, are you sure I'm the one you want? <laughs> and he's like, I'm not sure this is like my kind of movie. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, he was nominated as well, I think, for supporting. Mm, yeah, I think he was... Was he, he was, supporting yeah. or was he main? Supporting. He's not the main. Okay. Well, one, of, one of the things, too, like, what's interesting is it's good to see Mark Ruffalo get off, like, the superhero films. Because I think he almost got typecasted into just, you know, thinking that, you're, that he's the Hulk. And that's kind of it. Um, so good for him to go out 
and and dabble in the the other arts, just like Downey. I mean, Downey, after doing Sherlock and some other projects, and specifically Doolittle, which I watched that for the first time the other day, and that was that was, that was not it. I'm sorry, that was. It's not, not it. Eddie Murphy. Why would you watch it? True, but it's one of those situations where it's like it's really good that Ruffalo did that. The problem is, I think where, and again, I never saw this as Chase mentioned. I have not seen um, this film, but it's weird how sometimes they play the clips leading up to the awards. Or, like, you know, they go on, like, Good Morning America and, like, try to pitch to you this film. Every scene that they showed with Ruffalo, I kind of, it didn't really showcase anything for me, which was really weird that he was, you know, the scenes that they pick, of course, that's just scenes out of the whole grand film. But it was really weird that, like, okay, he was kind of, he kind of seemed like the oddball out in that category. But since you, since you said that, like, you know, he's, he's, you know, he actually did a really good job for what he was given. I mean, that's credit to him. Yeah, he, he he did do a good job, and he gets really mad in the movie. So I think the Hulk kind of is whatever method he went to get to that anger he used in this film because he got pretty mad in this film, screaming and yelling at Emma Stone, and Emma Stone looking at him dumbfounded. It seemed like at times, but no. Now the Barbie fans are gonna be happy, like you, Chase. Um, Bar- <laughs> Barbie won an award, and it was for best song. And I and it's not even the song that Ken performed that night that Ryan Gosling performed. It was the other one, which yep, I'm up to that. <laughs> you know the crazy part about all this, so Chase, okay, is everybody thinks that Barbie should have got different awards, and they they got basically handed a a on a golden spoon that won award that was like box office achievement crap during the uh, the Academy. So like that it counts, but it doesn't because it was just given to them uh, for no real reason. But the Barbie fans, okay, do they believe that they should have been nominated for some more stuff? Um, and probably should have won like set design and production design too, because I know that. Listen, regardless of what I think about Barbie, it had some pretty cool, at least like making you believe it was like in that fantasy realm of like the dolls and stuff like that. So, you know, maybe it could have won for that. You know, however, um, I do want to say to the Barbie fans that are all excited that you know they won this award for the best song. They had two chances out of five. I'm just like just just so they know. Two Barbie films were nominated. Okay, so you had the best odds to win. So, like, my money would have been on Barbie to win that award because if they did it, well, something's wrong. Yeah, um, I didn't expect Barbie to win that much. I expected them to win original song. And I expected them the song, What Was I Made For, would be the winner. I was hoping I'm Just Ken would win because, right, it would just be funny if I'm Just Ken won. That would be cool. But, nope. And uh, production design... Poor Things did way better than Barbie. Poor Things, they were very unique in their, um, in their production design. In fact, the production design in that movie, all of it's kind of a sexual innuendo, which is weird when you're watching the film. But anyway, um, so no, I, I, I think Barbie got what it got, and that's that. Sorry. <laughs> that try, that, they, people might make a big deal about it, but um, there were just too many good films that were in... And you have a film like Oppenheimer who just dominates it. I mean, look at Lord of the Rings when they had their Academy. It won every award it was nominated for. Every single one. All 11. Like that. Imagine being one of the nominees and Peter Jackson's winning everything. You're just sitting there like, oh my lord. And they're just like, alright, Lord of the Rings, here you go. Good job. So, at least they didn't have that coming. But they had Oppenheimer, which Oppenheimer did something that uh, I was reading about this. They broke a record, or they they did something that hasn't been done since the '50s, and it was nominated and won Best Picture, Best Director, Best Lead Actor, and Best Cinematography. That hasn't been done since 1959 with Ben Hur. So I think that's cool, like that that brought it back, and it deserved every one of those awards. So, yeah, it, it brought that back. And I like when modern films do that. And just think, like, that hasn't happened since 1959. That's a long, long time. It's it over is. 60 years. And it shows and it shows how powerful that film was in the box office. And everybody everybody kind of gave, like, Barbie the credit in that case when it was, like, the Barbenheimer, which, first of all, good marketing on both ends. I mean, for both campaigns to just run with it was, was brilliant. Um but the fact that I believe Oppenheimer almost broke a billion on its own, I think it finished somewhere around like 900 million. Like that to me, for a rated R 
historical film that had crazy legs and it showed and i know people that went back multiple times to see it and it's not easy to go back and watch like a three and a half hour film multiple times in theaters it's not yeah. and it was pretty cool so side side story because just a few weeks ago i was cruising in the caribbean and one of the ones which was island time midnight which was 1 a.m basically in america um they had adults only on the balcony all three stories of this major screen on the cruise ship outside was oppenheimer at one o'clock in the morning and to have and to have people like it was actually a really good crowd out there for being one o'clock in the morning and people um i don't want to say suffer through the late evenings of it because there, there was nothing to suffer other than the time was getting like you know people getting sleepy and stuff but people's reaction when the bomb goes off at los alamos you know it was it was pretty cool to experience that again on a cruise ship um now thankfully it didn't happen while i was on a cruise ship because it's a tsunami then but you know it's a it's a problem however um it was really cool to experience that so that's kind of like a side story but to get back to what i was saying earlier chase it's like it was like a snowball effect happening that night i was concerned about like i said killian murphy i did not know if he was going to get that award because it was coming off cinematography and then it went to Downey and Killian was like the, that kind of like, Oh man, he's got like a, I think he had that chance, but like, it was still like a 75 split probably. And yeah, yeah. so Killian, when he won, I was like, well, there's no way that Nolan doesn't win then. And then if Nolan does, you know, if Nolan wins, they can't deprive him of best picture because then you got best actor, best supporting actor, best cinematography and best direct. I was like, there's the four barrels based there's a four bullets in the gun i was like all you need to do is press the fire button and that's you know that's where best picture came in and best picture and like i said once once killian got it i felt like it was like the sweep was about to happen now granted they didn't sweep because like like you said there was somewhat that they lost awards on but to me to sweep all the main categories i mean you have to be happy yeah it was good i'm also happy be because of the winner of the animated feature film which was the boy and the heron what i like is that studio ghibli won the academy award and not disney i'm happy about that because studio ghibli's fun to watch now i haven't watched all the studio ghibli's but from the ones i have watched they're really fun they're really unique i know they lean towards more of the anime style but if you're not a fan of anime i'm sure you will like these because it's like it's it's not anime like you're thinking but um, I was told if you want to get an anime, start with Studio Ghibli. It's like an easy way to be like, okay, I think I can enjoy anime. And like, you know what? I don't enjoy anime, but I'm going to stick with this. But the boy and the hair in one, I thought that was really cool to see Studio Ghibli uh, win an award. Do they put Claymation under that? Just out of curiosity, or is Claymation its own category? Because back when Iowa Dogs came out, I can't remember if it had its own category or if it was an animation. I think it was animation. That's Wes Anderson. Um, mm -hmm. I think it is part of uh, animation. It has it's animated, so it's it's not real people. It's like a it's like a um, how do I explain this? I don't know. It's animated. Yeah. I would say, in the least, um, just a bunch of pictures kind of collaged on top of each other, which I guess again takes probably the most massive amount of skill to do. I mean, really, oh, God. to be attentive to detail and every little snapshot you take and have to readjust and stuff like that, that's, it's incredible. Now, cheap budget, definitely cheap. However, very time consuming. And I'm just kind of surprised they don't have that in its own category. I'll be quite honest with you. But again, probably one film would win every year because there's probably only one claymation film that comes out a year. At least that's like... That's probably, why, that's probably why they don't have their own categories because they're very rare. Like there's a company called Leica. L A I K A, and they've made Caroline, a uh, Coraline, excuse me, Coraline, and they've made the Box Trolls and those type of films. They're very unique films. I, we just watched the Box Trolls the other night, and you should go on Netflix and watch it because it's really, really funny, really funny movie. But yeah, it's the same. It takes forever to do that, so it's very unique. Um, but yeah, Floyd and the Heron won. I was excited to see that, um, and Elemental did not win. Also excited to see that. <laughs> so we're going to go through two real quick. And Chase, stop me if you um, stop me if you want to talk about them because I have not seen them. Best original screenplay, Anatomy of the Fall. Heard good things about that film. Have not seen it. 
and then best adapted screenplay was American Fiction. So kudos to everybody involved in those. I have not seen any of those. Don't have a clue. Um, yeah, I don't have a clue, to be honest with you. I have no say in it. Um, yeah. I feel like that's most of America. Yeah, yeah it's just like, okay, cool. They, they, someone didn't win. Killers of the Flower Moon didn't win a single award, but it got nominated for 10. And That is crazy, though, for 10. It's crazy to have that many and not win a single one. But Kills of the Flower Moon was a good film. It's just not the best film that Scorsese's made. It's not the best performance that DiCaprio has performed. It's just, like, it's a good movie. Everyone in it did really well. It's just when you look at it individually, it's not their best. They've done better. And I think that's kind of what did it. Um, And... I don't know. I just they just didn't do it. I, it just didn't have that oomph. I guess it was a little too long, from what I remember. It's like Indians and Goodfellas got together. It's what that film was really on, or Native Americans and Goodfellas. I guess I should say. Um, but it was based on the book, and um, I'm honestly surprised that it did not get a nomination for uh, adapted screenplay because it's based off of a book. So I'm actually surprised it didn't get nominated for that. But I was hoping that I was hoping that Killers of the Flower Moon got some attention, but at the same time, I'm glad it didn't because I don't think it deserved. Like Robert De Niro didn't deserve a nomination, in my opinion. He did a good job, but he's done better. He did better in Goodfellas and any other movie. Um, but I think one award that would have been cool for that one to win it would have been a adapted screenplay because it was a good screenplay. So that's my only thing to say about that movie because it came back in the theaters and I told myself I have to watch it because I don't know when I'll be able to see it because it goes on Apple TV Plus and I don't want to get another subscription to another, you know, another platform that I have to pay for. So so that's my comment on that movie. Well, that's great because, you know what, one of the things that I thought about this year too, and this is something how I figured we'll wrap up the Oscar piece too. All these other years, there's either been something, whether it's politically driven or whether it's like a popularity contest per se. And it's good that you said about how like, oh, I would have loved to have seen it be recognized, but I didn't want to see it recognized because it didn't deserve it. I feel like all the other Oscars past, there's been certain films that like didn't deserve it, but got it just because they are who they are. And I, I felt like this Oscars was actually as close to the old Hollywood standards of what oscars got awards because it was not only predictable at certain areas but the people that won deserved to actually win there wasn't like any major upsets you know as far as like upsets being like somebody that got it for like you know you look and you're like okay what was this about you know specifically to happen with best picture this year which was really good because there's been years in the past where best picture has been like question mark nobody actually saw it who rated this <laughs> you know and I'm not saying that it care like that it should matter about who went to see it or not because like I said that's not how you judge you know you you hope to get all these critics in a room that are the top of the industry that that say hey this is what cinema is and this is what we love, um, but Killers of the Flower Moon, I feel is one of those where critics went to go flock to see it praised it because Scorsese did it praised it because it had an all star cast, but I did not hear good reviews from the people that were anticipating it. Because you, earlier this year, you talked about how you were really excited for this film to come out. And the, fact that, like and, the, and the fact that I'm hearing you now, and even then when you came out of theaters talk about it here earlier on the podcast, you are just talking about it like, oh man, it's kind of disappointing. you know. So the fact that it did get nominated for 10 awards and didn't get it is probably justified because it feels like the critics liked it, but the audience did not. Yeah, that's kind of how it was. And I love Scorsese. Like, Goodfellas is one of my... I love that movie so much. Anytime I watch it, I just, I'm just i ready to make a movie. Like, I love those movies. And Goodfellas, I just... I love the story. I, I love every moment of that movie. So, and, and Scorsese does a good job. But every director has their duds, pretty much. The films they do really good at, duds. Even Nolan has his duds, in my opinion. But then they have films that are really good. And so... It's like directors have their time. 
they have their moments and Scorsese is a gangster director. He makes those movies. Those are his, like, if you want a gangster movie made, it is him. He is the king of it. Um, but uh, I actually have, um, do you have a comment? On no, I, w- I was just going to say that I think that Scorsese was a low-key gangster mafia back in the day, so he knows more stuff. I think he was. I think he was. <laughs> so I wanted to update the folks on two movies that I got from my collection. And I'm excited to show you this one. My first one is, of course, Oppenheimer. Still book. And, and look at the, you have one behind you. The one you have behind you is the a r- regular copy. Mine is the Steelbook copy at Walmart. Uh, I had to get it. I like this cover. I like the, I, I just like this cover, post and whatnot. Um, it's at Walmart right now. So if you like Steelbooks, go get it. They're probably going to run out. That's why I got it. But that was the first one I got. Really cool. I love it so much. And the other one was a gift from my lovely lady. Um, is also a steel book. It is Hacksaw Ridge. Take that off. It comes with a cover, which is great because steel books scratch really easy. So the fact that it has something to protect it is great. But no, Hacksaw Ridge it has that artwork in the front and the back. I love the steel books because they have special artwork and they don't look like the original poster. So I love this movie. I already own a copy of it, but I don't have this copy. So. I was real excited to show that to you, but those are the two added to the bookshelf, and I will update you guys on what else gets added. No, I mean that's really awesome. And you picked two historical films to do it, so I'm all I'm all there for it. Um, the cover that was actually or the the secret cover over top of the casing for Hacksaw Ridge was actually really cool because it's actually a medic sign, which they got really creative with uh, with that. Yeah, they so. did. It's so it's really cool. It actually, it comes with a cover, and then when you put it on, it actually covers. It shows his face in there. I, it it kind of reflects with the camera, but really cool. This is also at Walmart. They actually have a lot of cool steel books that just came out. So if you're by a Walmart or in a Walmart, go check it out. I know they have a couple. They have one for um, they have one for Dragonheart, the one from the '90s, and I love that movie. Even though it's bad CGI, I like that movie. And I told my lady like I have to get that one. So um, go to your Walmart, check it out. But yeah. So, Chase, we're going to move on to our main, or not really the main, that was the main, but we're going to move on to our final topic here today. I wanted to talk a little bit about this. We don't got to spend a lot of time, but today, breaking news, uh, I actually had to put out a segment on Spotify when it broke just to get my first initial reactions, but I wasn't going hard in depth because I knew that this podcast was coming out tomorrow and we could talk about it more in depth here. But George Lucas, well, let me start with saying this. Disney has been in a free fall. We've all understand that every time we come on the podcast no matter who it is we talk about disney being their free fall it's just that's the way it goes um but bob Iger is currently in a fight to keep the ceo slash to not lose shareholders and seats on the board to um i believe it was neil pelt if i stand correct i will look this name up real quick i think so where in the world is the name Otherwise, Nelson Peltz. Sorry. Okay, there we go. Bob Iger is in kind of a little bit of turmoil as far as keeping shareholders and his seat in the CEO position to Nelson Peltz, um, who they call an activist, which is really weird, Chase, that he gets an activist name because he's running out. Again, there could be other stuff behind the scenes, you know, and I don't know what all the alternatives are where he comes from. However, when Nelson talks about what he wants to do, he wants he would he wants a vision for Disney to be like, hey, let's go back to the old days. Let's create good family friendly content. Let's make money in the box office. Let's bring people back to the park. And that doesn't sound irrational. You know, it, it's, it it's yeah, it sounds like something that would be good. Um, and then I was reading this article, and it was great because now I have the Hollywood or, the Hollywood uh, Reporter article pulled up. I was watching a uh, MSNBC article earlier today. And they had like a video section that popped up and two people debated about this topic, which is George Lucas comes in defense of Bob Iger. Um, And I didn't know that George Lucas was actually a big shareholder because one thing that's not really reported or wasn't reported in my eyes was when he sold Star Wars to 
to Disney, and well, he sold Lucasfilm to Disney. He got the four point five billion dollars, but he got like thirteen point some million in in stocks and shares, which I didn't know. So this whole time he's had like shares in Disney. So these two these two analysts were going back and forth and talking about Nelson and how he's he's an activist and a threat to Iger, and you know it's good that George Lucas came out in support because. Um, Nelson wants to change things up and Bob's fighting for his job. And they listed the things like, you know, bringing people back to the parks and stuff like that. I said that Nelson did. And then they're like, well, I don't know why he wants to change. It's already happening. And I'm over here like, well, this is weird because we just heard that Disney lost a billion dollars last year in the film department. We just saw that the park attendance was low. And then on top of it, when they're talking in the background, they put a chart on on the Disney stock and the Disney stock behind them, the whole chart is down. And it's crazy. Yeah. Like, it's one of those moments that breaks your brain a little bit because it's just like, you know, it's crazy because you're talking about how good Disney's doing, but the, the analytics behind you, like the, whoever's in charge of the ads and putting them on the screen was like, oh, crap. Well, it's not. But, switch it, switch it. <laughs> like, I expected something like that out of ABC News to talk about because they're Disney owned. But yeah, it, yeah. It, it is crazy. So getting to this article, George Lucas backs Disney and Bob Iger in proxy fight, but... There's different layers to this. I just described one layer. The other layer is George Lucas's quote, which I have to read, Chase. I don't know if you've read the quote today. I have um, not read the quote. It's interesting. So he starts the quote with, creating magic is not for amateurs. That's an interesting philosophy. Okay, but we're going to move on. Okay, George. <laughs> when I sold Lucasfilm just over a decade ago, I was delighted to become a Disney shareholder because my law, my long-time admiration for his iconic brand and Bob Iger's leadership. When Bob recently returned to the company during a difficult time, I was relieved. No one knows Disney better. I remain a significant shareholder because of the full faith and confidence in the power of Disney and Bob's track record of driving long, long-term value. I have voted all, I have voted all my shares for Disney's 12 directors and I urge other shareholders to do the same. So it's good that he has support. Um, however, just not long ago, Chase, George Lucas ripped into Bob Iger at Disney for ruining his brand of Star Wars. He did. Yeah. So it's interesting that that is the case. Now, again, that's not even the biggest telltale sign. Okay, it's like it's a friend back up a friend, even though even in Bob Iger's book that came out like two, three years ago when he stepped down as Disney and he got that book deal. He actually basically bashed Lucas in there and said, oh, yeah, we broke the handshake agreement and stuff like that. So it was, I don't know what the Hollywood elites have in common. However, the start of the quote, Chase, creating magic is not for amateurs. I'm going to turn the floor over to you when you hear that. Creating magic is not for amateurs. Uh, okay, George. <laughs> I don't know. I don't really know how to respond to that. That's. It sounds like George is being forced to say certain things, is what it seems like. But um, it seems like, oh gosh. you know, I'm hearing this for the first time, so I haven't even had a minute to process what I heard, but I'm not surprised. I mean, look how much money George Lucas has made because of his decision to sell to Disney and this and that and his shares and whatnot. So um, with these people, it seems like money is the most important thing. It's what makes money. And he's probably going to side for the guy who made him money. Whether they broke their handshake agreement or not, that's pretty much where they're going to go downhill. I think this is a good segment of never meet your heroes. Not that George Lucas is my hero at all, but, you know, these people when they get their higher paychecks and whatnot, they feel like they're entitled to say what they want, throw their opinion out there, shove it down people's throat. Um, I wouldn't have made a comment like that, but that's just me. Um, I feel like I'm a little bit more humble, but I'm not making the money that he's making. Like, he, what would you say he got like $4 billion? I, don't, I, I forgot what number you said, but holy moly. Um, but yeah, what a weird comment. And I'm not surprised that he's siding with Disney. Because um, imagine, like, your 1977 when Star Wars first came out. It, it was just a movie that no one really cared about, it seems like. And 
it was like oh, this is going to go nowhere now 40 years later uh, over 40 years later it is now a theme park and it's a story that will never end and once you get different people involved in it even if they're big fans it's just going to get ruined unfortunately so i don't really have too much of a comment on what he said but the situation's interesting and Disney is just not what it used to be. And I don't know if it'll ever get back to what it used to be because everyone remembers what happened. Even when you go back to the golden age, like you will remember what a company did and how, what movies they came out with. And they lose their taste. They lose their niche of what they were. And, you know, I know that they're not coming up with new movies anymore or new ideas and everything's really filtered and more pushing an agenda and a message. But remember folks that we still have old Disney and you still have those old films that you can go back to. So even though it might not go forward in the way that you like, just look back and see what they did back in the golden age, back when we were kids. That's my advice when it comes to the Disney because I don't think it's going to get any better. And maybe they'll come out with like one really good idea or something, but it's just not going to be the same. And it's not supposed to be the same. Now, credit to George. If he really feels like he has his buddies back, I don't know how close him and Iger are. I mean, he's made some statements about Iger, but let's put that in the past, okay? Because that was the past. That was like, what, almost a decade ago that he sold it and it kind of got stabbed in the back. So maybe, you know, time mends all hearts, apparently. Um, but credit to him if he is being a true friend and backing his friend. I, I get that. Like, there's, there's part of me that can be respectful about that, about that because Bob Iger right now in Disney is on a sinking ship. Um, and he's currently the captain of the, sh the sinking ship. But it's good to see that his crewmates and people like that are willing to go down with the ship also. You know, if they truly believe in that vision. So credit yeah. to George for doing that, if that's the case. Um, but what I have to ask, though, is why didn't he just stay silent? Because he didn't have to choose a side. Like, it was really weird to just come out and be like, you know, this is almost like, and I picked on uh, James Cameron earlier today, so I'm going to pick on James Cameron again. When the, um, everybody, you can pull up the clips, but when James Cameron um, was talking about uh, what was the submarine that exploded earlier last year? Remember that whole um, Titan? Oh, uh, yeah, Titan. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So James Cameron goes on like a CNN or whatever, mainstream media, and they're talking about the submarine and that company and that owner. And James Cameron like three times was like, well, I'm not associated with it. Nobody said you were. <laughs> like, no, nobody said you were, James. <laughs> like, so yeah. it's kind of weird. Shut that, up, like, James. It, it's, it's kind of weird that like George picked the side. He didn't have to. Like, that, yeah. that's the crazy part about this. But, again, here nor there, one of the things I'm more upset about, and, again, I don't know where the amateur or not for amateurs or where he's aiming that title at, like, saying um, creating magic is not for amateurs. I'm not sure if he's talking, like, somebody coming up and rising up through the board that thinks they can magically take over this company. You know, an amateur in the business realm can just spin yeah. something into gold. Or if he's talking about, like, creators, because... George, not that long ago, you were an amateur leaving USC. THS, THX 1138 was not a professional film by any means. Like, it was, yeah, it's a cult classic to some people. But that was a low-budget amateur thesis film. American Graffiti almost didn't get released. I mean, it was, it was an amateur film. And even the first... Everyone starts somewhere. Yeah, and even and even the first Star Wars. Now, granted, I said this earlier today. It got produced by 20th Century Fox, you know, and it got distributed. But that was still a quote unquote amateur film, as far as not knowing the direction and the science fiction and like the the designs behind all this. Now, what you've done since has been amazing. Now, except for Red Tails, Red Tails was not a good film, and we could argue like maybe the last Indiana Jones that he did was not a good film either. But it tops. Oh, it's a it's a cream. Well. Was he? I don't think Dial of Destiny was the one I was talking about. I was talking about King of the Crystal Stalls. I don't know if George Lucas had anything to do with Dial of Destiny, to be honest with you. Well, but, you know, Dial of Destiny makes Kingdom of the Crystal Skull look oh, really good. it looks golden compared to Dial of Destiny. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, in retrospect, it's like watching the first Jaws, in, in this case, because you're a big Jaws fan. It's like watching the first Jaws and being like, oh, this is amazing. We're waiting for the sequel. It's going to be even awesomer. And then all these other Jaws come out. You're like, you know what? It makes the first one look a whole lot better. Oh, the first one's so good. And I got to meet Richard Dreyfus, which was really cool as well. Yeah. 
I'll shut up about that. <laughs> no, continue. Cool um, but yeah, I mean, I just, I'm more disappointed with the whole free magic is not for amateurs. Because George, I mean, I know that you're aging out of here, buddy, but stay with the times. I mean, you were that at one time. And that's, yeah. that's kind of a disappointing comment. And, and, and yeah. the other thing is, too, is a lot of Star Wars fans, I've been, it's been hit up on social media all day for me and YouTube pages like Tyrell Magnus came out with this. I don't know if you watch Tyrell Magnus. I would recommend to anybody to watch Tyrell. He's just hysterical. And plus, he's honest with what he, with what he says and does. So Tyrone came out today and looked, just stared right into the camera. He's like, really? And every Star Wars fan, too, like that has backed George Lucas, has wanted George Lucas back, that has like been very anti-Disney for how they treated George. It's kind of like a slap in the face. To everybody that was defending you. And I was like, you know, I mean, I get it. George will forever be in our hearts. I mean, you don't want to disrespect the guy. He's honestly, to me, he's the reason why I got in the film. I I spent more time watching the behind the scenes of how Star Wars was made than watching the Star Wars films themselves. Yeah, so yeah. to me, you know, George Lucas, James Cameron, I put J.J. Abrams up there. I know that he probably doesn't belong up there in that category, but he's up there for me. But George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, well, George Lucas right now because we're only talking about George Lucas. But George Lucas is up there as far as the top filmmakers to me personally. And I think he's always going to be remembered as that. As that. But this is kind of a sad day. I agree with you except J.J. Abrams. That's the only one I don't agree with. But everyone else, I can I can agree with on that. Yeah. Um, no, I'm just not big on J.J. Abrams because of what he did with Star Trek. But that's a whole nother topic and a whole nother podcast <laughs> i agree so everybody thank you for tuning in to movie mayhem sorry it's been a while um things have popped up here and there however we are getting ready to kind of announce another shield Pro productions film i know it has been a while um since we put out a film on this channel but you can go watch our other brother channel which has put out two short films within the past three months so go check those out at vigilante pictures but also we have a, another film that's coming out later this year that we start production on in May, and this is a Chase Morgan Hewlett film, which Shield of Hope is proud to help produce. So, Chase, is there anything you want to address to the crowd and where they can find you at and what's coming up? You can follow me, follow me on Instagram at Chase Morgan Hewlett, but True Light Pictures is the company that I, like, I'm the owner, I guess you could say, of it. We have a channel. It's at True Light Pictures, and we also have an Instagram page at True Light Pictures. Um, and the only thing I can say is stay tuned. I'm a secretive man. I like, I like surprising people, but yeah, stay tuned. Um, yeah, go watch the Reluctant Blues trailer. That should be coming out in the summer, uh, or in the early summer out on the YouTube channel. So go check that out. Well, everybody, thank you for tuning in. Catch us on the next episode. Also go back and watch other episodes where we have like, share, subscribe, do all the fun stuff. Smash that like button, as I like to say. Thank you guys for watching. See you next time.